or Hoboken or anything else. Mr. Fishman, Mr. Fishman, based on the evidence that you have uncovered, who do you believe or who, who does the evidence point to as the originator of this scheme? Uh, I'm not going to comment beyond what's in the indictment. Mr. Fishman, yeah. they were not seeking benefit, benefit for themselves. They were seeking an endorsement for Governor Chris Christie. So how can it be that when they weren't the beneficiaries and he was, that they're the criminals and no one else is? Well, there are, first of all, there are a host of federal laws that make it a crime to get a benefit for a third party. And sometimes the third party can be a participant, third, sometimes the third party is not a participant. Sometimes the third party knows, and sometimes the third party doesn't know. I'm not going to talk about anything else with respect to this case, but I don't, legally and logically, there's not an inconsistency there, and it's certainly not different from things that have happened in other cases in which we've charged people with trying to get a benefit for somebody else. Mr. Fishman, a two-parter here. Firstly, was Christie one of the public officials who was misled here? And number two, during the course of your investigation, what did you learn about the culture of Governor Christie's office at this campaign? Okay, so first of all, I'm not going to comment about who was or was not misled about whether there was or was not a traffic study, except to the extent that the indictment alleges that various Port Authority personnel were, were told that there was a traffic study when there was not. Uh, and the indictment also mentions two separate press releases or press statements issued by the, by the public relations or the media or the government relations department of the Port Authority talking about a traffic study, and the indictment alleges that when that statement was issued, was it was, the statement's issuance was caused by Baroni and Wildstein, and they knew that it wasn't true when they asked that to happen. In addition, I, you know, the, the indictment also charges that Mr. Baroni's testimony in front of the state legislature was false in, in three material respects, uh, about the role of Port Authority police officers, about a traffic study, and then his statement to the, to the Transportation Committee to the effect of that he was devastated by the fact that he had, he, uh, had about what had happened to his relationship with Mayor Sokolich because he treasured that relationship and that relationship had been harmed by what was a breakdown in communications when in fact, as the indictment alleges, he purposely chose not to respond to, if you look at the indictment, the seven, eight, or nine emails, texts, and messages that he got from Mayor Sokolich saying, my kids can't get to school, people can't get to work, people can't get over the bridge, and there are real issues of life and safety. Yeah? Uh, the second part of that question, I'm sorry, about what you learned about the culture of Governor Christie's office. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't comment on culture. That's not, my, that's not my expertise. That's I leave that to other people. We uh, looked through these charging documents and so on. <clears throat> Most of this stuff has been known for months. Why has it taken so long for us to get here today. Okay, so um, when you say it's known, I'm not sure exactly what that means. We have a particular role, a particular responsibility, and a particular obligation in the U.S. Attorney's Office and in the Department of Justice, together with the FBI and the IG, and every law enforcement agency with which we work. When, when, we're, when we're conducting an investigation, we have to figure out effectively three things. What happened? Who's responsible? And can, maybe four, is it a crime? And can we prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? That's a very important part of the equation for us, because ethically, although we can get an indictment returned simply on a showing of probable cause, that's the legal standard, it is our ethical obligation in the department not to bring a case until we are satisfied that we can prove that case to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. That's different from, from what the obligations may be in the press or in other parts of the government it's a very special obligation for us and one which we take very seriously. Can I ask a question, yeah. can I, can I, can I ask a question Mr. Sure. Mister, please? Sure. Um, uh, this has been an extremely damaging uh, development for the Port Authority. What does it say about the culture of, of the Port Authority back then that essentially it sounds like two people were able to make this thing happen without anybody knowing, you know, stopping? That's what it says in the uh, indictment. And uh, we're working very hard to correct any of the problems that we had. Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. No, you, you, you went already. You, you were quiet. You know, it's okay. The, the plea agreement with uh, Wildstein, what sentence did that Okay, so, so the, the plea agreement with David Wildstein carries a maximum theoretical term of imprisonment on counts one and two of 15 years. The plea agreement states that the applicable sentencing guidelines for him is a level 16. As we all, as you probably, those of you who cover us regularly know, those are advisory guidelines. They don't bind the judge, but they are the stepping off point for sentencing analysis. Level 16 is 21 to 27 months. Um, but um, he, as he, as was said in open court today, 
he is cooperating with the United States. He has been cooperating for some time, and is and it is typical when people are cooperating for that cooperation to be brought to the attention of the sentencing judge, and for the sentencing judge to take that into account at the time of sentencing. Mr. Fisher, yeah. yeah um, the George Washington Bridge has been one of the top. I'm speaking to a retinue of federal law enforcement officials. This has been four stars. The George Washington Bridge has been a number one terror target that has taken a lot of resources. Why is that not reflected in this indictment? I see the civil rights, and that's novel, using that for people who normally did not have access to this, this bridge. But what about the fact that this was on the anniversary of September 11th at a time when the entire nation was ginned up for a potential attack? And I don't see any reference to that. Is that, is that an aggravating factor? Is it not relevant to the Department of Justice? Well, it's, 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 it's not actually an element of any of the crimes that are charged. Um, that's that's what I'll Maybe say. Maybe it should be a law, perhaps. Should Congress think about well, such a thing? I mean, it depends. I mean, it, I, I'm not sure what law you recommend. I don't actually recommend laws to Congress. I'm very bad at that, um, and and so I'm not sure it's actually something I could do. But it's certainly something that people in the press could write about. Mr. Fisher, um, you yes. I'm not going to say how long he's been cooperating. I will say he's been cooperating for some time. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to say anything more than we have an obligation to bring cases only when we believe we can prove them to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and that's, that, that's what I will say. Yeah. Can you uh, characterize the cooperation of Mr. Wildstein and how that had a bearing on what you recommended uh, to the judge in terms of sentencing? Well, we ha uh, first of all, we haven't recommended anything to the judge in terms of sentencing. That recommendation will take place before he gets sentenced, which is now scheduled for August 6th. Um, I will say it is typical in cases in which someone is cooperating for sentences, and I see Dave Porter nodding his head, for, for sentences to get postponed until after someone's cooperation is complete, um, and so that the judge can, in fact, do what the judge is obliged to do and we're obliged to do, which is to take into account the full nature and extent of a defendant's cooperation. Um, but that, that time is not yet upon us. What? No, I can't. I mean, I can, but I won't. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to comment on any plea negotiations we may or may not have with the defendants in this case or any other case. Mr. I'm sorry? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, so I can't really answer that question. I'm not going to comment on whether anybody is going to be further investigated with connection with this or any other matter ever. Can the only thing. I'm sorry? I'm not going to say whether witnesses are or are not cooperating. Mr. Fisher, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't follow, I didn't follow that question. No, I didn't follow your question. So, Governor Christie's own lawyer said, and in testimony before the legislature, there was testimony that Governor Christie's incoming chief of staff supervised the testimony, the Bill Baroni testimony that you say is knowingly and misleading and false, that she hand edited it, that it was delivered to Trenton from the Port Authority by hand. How can you supervise something that is knowingly and misleading and false and edit it but not be in any way involved in it. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I, I completely appreciate the premise of your question because the, the facts to which you are alluding are not in either the information to which Mr. Wildstein pled guilty or in the indictment. But I will answer your question more generically that the standard for including someone in a criminal charge uh, is a knowing and intentional participation in a crime. And so, and, and so we're clear Mr. Baroni is not charged in a separate count, which we talked about before, about the testimony before the legislature, because that would not by itself probably be a federal crime. What, what the indictment charges and describes is that in order to disguise and cover up the plan to punish Mayor Sokolich, the defendants concocted a cover story that they needed to perpetuate, and the very perpetuation of that cover story was itself a misuse of Port Authority resources. Mr. 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 Mayor Sokolich was not the only political figure in New Jersey who refused to endorse the governor after being courted by his office. Is it clear to you why the governor's people chose to target him so 
Um, I'm not, again, I'm not going to comment about why Mr. Mayor Sockledge was or was not singled out. Um, the, the indictment relates to a specific course of conduct, particular activities that took place with respect to that plan. That's all I'm going to say. Can you characterize when your office began looking into this case? The only, the only thing I will say is, is what we've said before, which is on January 9th of last year, we put out, a, I think it was a one-sentence statement that said that we had received a referral from Mr. Nestor's office, and we were reviewing it. That's all I can say. Mr. Fisher? Uh, no, you haven't. Jason, you haven't gone. Are there mm -hmm. unindicted co-conspirators in this, and if they are unindicted, why? Um, okay, so um, there, the indictment does ref, does say Bridget Kelly, Bill Baroni, David Wallstein, and others. Um, we don't identify unindicted co-conspirators in our indictment by name unless they have been previously mentioned in a publicly filed court document, and that is not the case here. Um, there may come a time during the course of the proceedings um, when we will make a disclosure to the court or to defense counsel about who those unindicted co-conspirators are, but it's Department of Justice policy not to do that now. About how many unindicted Not going to answer that question either. Mr. Fisher, you talked about how much assignment of resources and manpower and so forth. Do we have any kind of dollar figure on how much, you know, in terms of overtime that this cost actually? Well, let me say this. First of all, we don't pay overtime, sadly. Um, I'm sure that Mr. Khan and Mr. Cortez and Mr. Feeder would like it if we did, but we don't. Um, and so, and we don't keep track of our investigations by money. It, every investigation is different. It has a different pace. It has different resource requirements, both in terms of person power and in terms of investigative resources and in terms of supplies. It, is, it has been my policy for the five and a half years I have been United States Attorney to make sure that every investigation, no matter how large or how small, how high profile or how under the radar, gets exactly the resources that it needs to make sure that when we are done, we can say proudly and fairly that we have done the best job that we can. I wasn't talking about the cost of the investigation per se. I'm talking about the cost of their supposed traffic study and so forth. Oh, well, no, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question, although I'd like the answer that I gave. Anyway, um, the, uh, the, the, what we've said, the requirement of Section 666 is that it be more than $5,000. I believe, and um, Mr. Cortez or Mr. Connick can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the plea agreement with Mr. Wildstein stipulates, for purposes of his guideline calculation, that it was between ten and $30,000. Are there any state laws violated? Is there a state referral? Um, uh, also curious, um, well, first on that, and then I follow up. On the Christie matter, uh, we've seen in campaign finance cases, your office, through its ethical responsibilities, has identified the campaign not as a co conspirator, but as a victim. And I'm curious of your view of this that Mr. Christie was victimized by the defendants in this case. Well, actually, if you, if you, I mean, I, th I think the theory of the indictment is quite clear that the Port Authority was a victim in the case, because it's Port Authority resources that were misused, allegedly, by the, by the defendants. Um, with respect to your state law referral question, um, we sometimes refer matters to other jurisdictions, other federal agencies, other state agencies. We never publicize it when we do. We don't talk about it. Um, and, and if we do that, and I'm not saying whether we did or didn't in this case, then those agencies are free either to announce that they've received a referral or to do what we would do, which is to quietly investigate until we are satisfied that there's a, no case to be brought or there is a case to be brought. And would we be accurate to say Mr. Christie is clear in terms of federal charges in the Bridgegate matter. What, 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 what I've said, I've, I've said exactly the way I said it before, that based on the evidence currently available to my office and to the agents with whom we've been working, we will not be bringing any further charges related to the, to the matters discussed in today's indictment. Mr. President, uh, there was discussion in court today uh, about uh, David Wildstein having reached an agreement sometime around January. Uh, was, was a plea deal reached then and then formally entered today? Is that how well, so the, the way it works is, is the, the, a plea agreement is memorialized, typically with our office, in a letter between our office and the defense, from, from us to the defense, because it's a letter, it has a date at the top. The, the date of the letter that was sent by our office to Mr. Zegas, Mr. Wildstein's attorney, was January 12th of this year. Uh, as you heard in open court, they signed it on January 21st and returned it sometime soon after that. Uh, and then that letter is effectively, it's effectively a contract um, that obliges the defendant to do certain things and us to do certain things. And if you don't have a copy, we can get you a copy. And uh, pursuant to that agreement, he was to plead guilty and in, it, to, to these two charges and to undertake various other obligations. And we have various obligations in response, one of which is to bring the, the amount and extent of his cooperation to the attention of the sentencing judge 
at the time he was sentenced. And you said uh, 21 to 27 months, that's, that's roughly the, the... That's the guideline, that's the recommended guideline range sentence. Based on his cooperation? No, no, okay. no, based on the crimes to which he pled guilty. That is completely independent of his cooperation, except to the extent that when you do a guideline calculation, the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a calculus, and he, he was entitled to a three points lower for having taken responsibility fully for his actions and cooperating. So without those three points, he would be a level 19, which is uh, uh, a somewhat longer recommended guideline range. What kind of punishment does Kelly and Barone see if they are indicted? Uh, again, theoretically, the theoretical maximum, if you added up the total exposure on all of the counts to which each is um, subjected, and it's seven, oh, it's a nine count indictment, seven, they're each named in seven counts because they're each not named in two of the wire fraud counts. Uh, their, their total theoretical exposure is 86 years. But, um, as with Mr. Wildstein, that number actually bears no relationship to what their sentence would likely be in the event of a conviction. Their, their guideline calculation would be a little higher than Mr. Wildstein's. I'm not prepared to say exactly what it would be, just because you don't know how it's exactly going to shake out in the end. But it would not be substantially more than Mr. Wildstein's. Of course, as the judge made quite clear today in court, and it's important that everybody understand this, it is entirely up to her at the end of the day as to what sentence Mr. Wildstein would get and in the event of a conviction what sentence Mr. Baroni or Ms. Kelly would get. 86 years each? 86 years, that's like a theoretical maximum. There's no way you're going to see a sentence anywhere near, nor would it be appropriate. And we would never ask for anything like that. Yes. Yeah. Given the focus of this investigation on Malfeas and his report authority, do you think Governors Christie and Cuomo were correct to veto legislation that aimed to mitigate against that sort of thing? Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on whether people in the, in the executive branch are correct or not correct in vetoing legislation. Um, you know, the, as the inspector general said, um, there were obviously, there were obvious deficiencies here in the way the poor authority was being run that permitted something like this to occur. Um, and, and to the extent that reforms need to be undertaken, it's not really my job to do that. Um, it's really the job of, the, of maybe perhaps the state legislatures and certainly the, the board of commissioners of the Port Authority. Tom. Can you walk through again, please, how, why uh, Baroni's false testimony didn't bring a charge? And is it fair to reason from that that if members of the administration who coached him in that testimony knew that testimony was false, that's not a crime either? Okay. So his, his testimony, in order for us to have federal jurisdiction over false testimony as a general proposition, it has to be a false testimony before or intended to be conveyed to a federal agency. And so, as an, as an or, in the ordinary course, standing alone, without any of the other, other um, attendant circumstances and context in which it took place, if someone today goes down and testifies falsely in front of the state legislature about a matter that's within the purview of that committee to hear, that would not be a federal crime. If they did it in front of Congress, in front of a grand jury, in a federal court, in a deposition, in a federal civil proceeding, that would be a different matter, but in, in standing alone. But that's not the context in which it's charged, and that's why it's not charged as a standalone count. Mr. Baroni's testimony is charged as both an overt act and a means and method of perpetuating the conspiracy that he entered with Ms. Kelly and Mr. Wildstein long before that, in the summer of 2013, when they agreed that they would misuse the resources, misapply, take for their own purposes resources of the Port Authority to punish Mayor Sokolich with all the attendant consequences that would have. And one of the ways in which they did that was by concocting a cover story so that they could get people to help them. And, and they had uh, cops working extra duty, they had an extra toll collector, they had engineers doing, collecting data that no one ever wanted or would ever use. And one of the things that, that, that the natural outgrowth of that was that when called to explain it, Mr. Baroni would continue the charade of then making the same kind of false statements in front of the legislature. And in fact, embellishing it by, by allegedly talking about how it had all been instigated between, by a conversation between Mr. Wildstein and members of the Port Authority Police Department. So the question for us is, did anybody like Regina G, the former chief staff, or Philip Kwan, who was a Christie appointee, if they knew this testimony was false? There's nothing in here, nothing that you're saying that tells us yes or no. That nothing in here tells us, nothing in here tells you yes or no. That's correct. There's nothing in here that tells you yes or no about anybody except the people who are mentioned in the documents. So, so then, based on, this is all, the charges are all based on the evidence that was presented to you and that you collected with your investigators. Then, what kind of evidence would you need to see before you could indict others who may have ordered this? Um, 
you know, you're an enterprising reporter, I am sure, although I have no idea who you are. Um, so, um, but if you're as smart as Moran, um, you'll be able to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, Well, I know you haven't said this in the indictment, but why haven't you told us how they came up with this Because, idea? look, there, every case in which we bring, there are, there's always going to be evidence, facts, documents, other things that will ultimately be presented at trial that are not included in an indictment. Not everything that every witness tells us, not everything that we've learned is necessarily important enough or, or, or um, needs to be interwoven in the indictment or the information itself that's issued today. Um, anybody here who has sat through a trial has heard evidence that's never been mentioned in an indictment, not because it's not relevant, because we just don't put everything in. And so um, if, if, there, if there's a trial in this case and if you cover it, I am sure you will hear some of that at the trial. Maybe you'll be a question will be answered and maybe not, but it's just not in the indictment. We have to wait till the next episode? And it's, 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 like the, it's like the end of Downton Abbey and you've got to wait until a whole other season. <laughs> March 2011, as, as this idea about closing lanes began to percolate. percolate. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? I, I can't, but it does. It does refer to the fact that the indictment does refer to early thoughts or conversations about how the lanes could be used as leverage. All right, the three of them, or just five. Again, I'm not going to say anything beyond what's in the indictment. Yeah, I'm just trying. Yep. To, uh, yep. Oh, sorry. So, I mean, these are people who are paid with public dollars, with the money that's collected from people. Um, the way that Governor Christie has presented. No. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, yep. Page 21 of the indictment, um, there's a reference to Baroni and Wildstein having a strategy of pulling apps. It's a quote that yes. says that it was a strategy of scheduling a meeting they intended to cancel all along as they did with apps in court for the court of the tenant punished me for Mayor Fuller from Jersey City who was represented at apps. Um, was that to punish him for failing to endorse? And I'm not. I'm not going to comment on the reason for the punishment. That that there's a there's a there's an exchange, as you saw, an electronic exchange between conspirators in the case that referred to that that referred to pulling a FAPS, and that was a shorthand, as the indictment describes, or a code between the co-conspirators for something they had already done once before, um, which was to schedule a meeting, pretending that they were going to have the meeting, and then canceling it. Uh, and so it's in there to explain that context so that you can understand what the two of them were calling about and what, what talking about and what their strategy is. Yeah, I just wanted to, you, you mentioned on this side of the room the idea that there are others that's mentioned in it and others. And so there's unknown, unindicted co-conspirators. And then also you said on this side of the room that in the case right now without any new evidence, um, you'll not be charging any additional individuals in relationship to this scheme. Could you reconcile those two comments? I can. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I can yes, and I will. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to, to, to charge someone and to convict someone, we, as I said before, have an obligation only to bring a case in which we have sufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone is in fact guilty of a crime. That is not the standard for somebody to be an unindicted co-conspirator. Because the standard for an unindicted co-conspirator can be less than that. It could also be that we don't intend to charge somebody who was involved. That's also possible. Could it mean they're I'm not, I'm not going to speculate what it could mean. I'm just, I'm, I'm just telling you, is that, is that in particular, though, the standard for, for someone to be identified down the road or in the grand jury as an unindicted co-conspirator is different than the standard for us to indict someone with the intent of trying them and convicting them. Has this grand jury been dismissed? Is I'm not going to comment on whether grand juries come, go, stay, or leave. Well, uh, I'm not going to comment about who or is not is or is not independent. State law crimes can be prosecuted either by the state attorney general or by a county prosecutor. Was there a referral? I I think I answered before that I'm not going to answer that. Oh, you're not gonna yeah, I'm not going to answer that. Yeah. Mr. Fishman, so are you still in the evidence gathering stage right now? Is that because you say based on the evidence, you will not be any other people charged with respect to the bill. So, are you in your office? Without respect to this investigation, we are never out of that business, ever, in any case. From the time we start investigating 
unless and until the jury comes back one way or the other, we are always continuing to investigate. We always receive new evidence. We always gather new evidence. Some of it is relevant. Some of it is helpful. Some of it is not. And so it would be irresponsible of me to say we're done gathering evidence because it, it, it's something that we should always be willing to take, look for, listen to, and evaluate. Otherwise, we're not doing our jobs. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer that question anyway, but I'm not. Yeah. I, I, with, with, uh, not, that, not that I know of, but. Can I ask you? Uh, sure, Dave. Sorry, well, I want to ask you sort of what I asked Mr. Messick about. This is, you've seen all the evidence. I'm assuming you've seen that. So, well, collectively, we've I mean, seen all the evidence. How could this have happened at an agency like the Port Authority where there are protocols and procedures and levels of accountability? And they didn't do this in a darkened room and all of a sudden string it on the world. It was. Well, they sort of. Well, but the they, allegation is they sort of did do it in a darkened room, right? So the, the allegation is that, that, the, that the scheme was concocted uh, and that, and that to, to effectuate the scheme, to put it into to effect, certain things needed to happen. They needed to, they, uh, they needed to talk to, to engineers. They needed to talk to people at the bridge. And, and, you know, the indictment alleges that these people were asked to do stuff by their boss and, and did. Um, and, and, the, and the indictment alleges that those bosses kept other bosses in the dark. And so, I mean, I, you know, there, there may be more complicated reasons, but that's the essential allegation in the indictment. Can you give us your how unusual the scheme is and the charges? No, I, look, so, so I don't know how unusual the scheme is. Every scheme and every case we do is different. Um, uh, people are constantly thinking about new ways to commit crimes, um, and we're constantly trying to catch them. Uh, so um, the fact that somebody misused, I, I, I confess, I have never seen a case in which people misused the resources of the Port Authority, particularly to change lanes, of the, to close certain lanes of the George Washington Bridge, um, in an effort to punish somebody politically for failing to endorse the candidate that they wanted them to endorse. Um, so, but, but every scheme is different. Uh, in terms of, of novelty, as I said earlier, Section 666, which is the statute that is, forms the underlying basis of counts 1 and 2, and the wire fraud statutes, which comprise the underlying basis of counts 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, are statutes we use all the time. Um, there are, you know, when, when, when Mr. Imber, who's in the back of the room, but who is um, overseeing this investigation for me, when he and I tried the mayor of Passaic in 1992, 666 was a charge in that case. 666 was a charge that was used against Sharp James. It was used against Joseph Voss. Um, it's, not, it's a statute to which we frequently turn in matters of corruption because Congress decided that it was really important to make it a, a crime of federal jurisdiction if people take resources, money, bribes, things for their benefit or for the benefit of other people from state and local agencies that get federal money. They didn't like that. And so we use that statute because it fits a lot of the cases that we investigate. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Fishman, um, Governor Christie was your predecessor in this office. That's true. Has his connections, um, his former connections to the office made it challenging? Or have you had to take any unique steps? I don't think we've had to take any unique steps. Um, the, you know, the, um, the, he is my predecessor, but we're not investigating his actions when he was my predecessor. We're investigating actions that took place during a particular week in September of 2013 that don't involve my office or, 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 the, or, or activities to place in my office. I will say this, though. Um, uh, there's nobody who was working on this case in my office, no lawyers working on this case in my office, who was hired by Governor Christie. Not one. And, and, and that's not entirely an accident, but I have to say, even if that weren't true, um, I have enormous confidence, um, and it would be inconsistent with every every single way in which I have thought about this office and the way I have conducted myself both as a line assistant and as a supervisor, supervisor the, or as the United States Attorney, to take an action, to, to begin an investigation that would compromise the way the public perceives us. That is much more important than my involvement or anybody else's involvement to me. The way our office is perceived by the public is critical. And if the public can't have the confidence in what we do, if I can't be proud of, if I can't be confident in the people who are working for me and be completely convinced that every decision they are making is in the best interest of the case and, in, and obtaining a fair, thorough, comprehensive, and just result, then I'm not doing my job and I should quit. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Wildkin's attorney today said that the government is satisfied with his cooperation 
and that evidence exists that Ms. Christie knew about uh, these lane closures. Could you speak to the cooperation claim? That are you, in fact, happy? And has he presented this evidence to you? Okay, so I'm not going to comment at all about any evidence that anybody has presented to us, except you can gather what you can gather from what he said in open court under oath that he's told us that. Um, the, you know, as far as happy or unhappy with cooperation, there will come a time when he is sentenced, when we will have an opportunity, and you will all be there, um, when we will submit documents to the court, um, expanding on and detailing the nature, extent, and value of his cooperation, and either urging the judge to take it into account or not, depending on how, um, whether we perceive that a witness has been truthful or not. But that, as I said, that day is not around the corner. I don't expect it will happen in August, honestly, unless this case goes to trial before August. Um, I don't expect that, Mr. I, honestly, I don't expect that Mr. Wildstein will be sentenced. It is typical for cooperating witnesses not to be sentenced until after the trials at which they are called to testify so that the judge can take into account the extent, nature, value, and honestly the credibility of the witness because he's, if the case goes to trial in front of Judge Wigginton, he will testify in front of the judge by whom he will be sentenced. Mr. Fishman, you talk about the public confidence in your office and, and, and the work that you do here. Why not just be straight with the public and tell them what you know about what a man who may be running for president knew or did not know and what your office knows about Governor Christie and just so we can all have a good understanding well, of the man had no idea like he claims or there's more to it? Because, because, Jonathan, those to two parts of your question are, in fact, irreconcilable, unlike the question I was asked by this gentleman over here. Because my obligation as the United States Attorney is not to disclose evidence that was presented to a grand jury or not. So I can't actually disclose things that we know unless and until there is a public proceeding at which you they come out. answer questions about things that were obtained and were outside the grand jury process. Te te that, that's a very complicated dance, Jonathan, and one in which I don't think it's productive to engage. I have, I have said something, I think actually, that I've never said before at a press conference, which is that based on the evidence available to us today, we are not going to bring further charges with relationship to the bridge case. I don't, you, you've covered me for five and a half years. I've never said anything like that, and I say it because the public has a right to know certain things, and I'm going as far as I believe I can ethically go in, in commenting on what's the state, the state of the evidence and the state of our investigation. Mr. Now, Voriakis is next. Um, if they thought they were just engaged in a political stunt or, you know, hardball <coughs> politics, is that a sufficient defense, or do, do you have to show that they knew they were breaking federal law? Well, there's a, again, that's, that's not the entire universe, I think, of, of questions that you could ask. The question is, did they knowingly, the question here will be, did they knowingly and intentionally misuse the resources of the Port Authority, misapply them, convert them to, the, to their own use, for a purpose that they knew was impermissible? They don't necessarily have to know that that itself would violate federal law. They just have to know basically that. I, I, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, if I were a historian, I might have an answer, um, but I'm not, so I don't. Yeah. Mr. Christian, uh, your counterpart in New York, Creeper Ferrara, has gone so far as to say, in his very busy caseload, you know, in New York, there's a cauldron of corruption. Um, that's apples and oranges. However, you know, why won't you go so far as to uh, tell the public, you know, your findings? Was there a culture of corruption within the Port Authority and or within Governor Christie's office? That, I think, is something that's on the minds of the taxpayers. It is on the minds of the taxpayers, but it's not up to me and my office to make that judgment or to offer that opinion, with all due respect to my colleague across the river. Um, um, there, are, there are plenty of people who have the opportunity to look at that, but most particularly um, Chairman Degnan and the members of the Port Authority Board. Uh, and, and my job is much more limited than that. My job and the, pe and the jobs of the people who are my colleagues is, as I said before, to figure out A, what happened, B, is it a federal crime, C, who's responsible, and D, can we prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? That's it. Yeah. I'll take two more and then we're going to go. When you mentioned uh, the possible theoretical sentencing uh, for, for uh, uh, Kelly and uh, uh, Maroney, if they were to be found guilty, uh, you say it's slightly higher than, than, than for, for wild scenes. Is that referring to slightly higher than 21 to 27 months or slightly higher than 15 years? Slightly higher than 21 to 27 months. He's, uh, you know, the, 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 as I said, there's no 
expectation here that people are going to be getting sentences in those in those double digit numbers that to which you referred and which are the theoretical maximums in this case um, and and so theirs would be higher I can't I, you know uh, I'm gonna I won't speculate but somewhere you know 12 24 months more than that because the because his calculation is lower because he gets three points lower in the guidelines for his early acceptance of responsibility are you closing the door on I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I didn't say I was even closing the door on this investigation. What I, I was very careful about that. No, we're not closing, we, we're not, we're, I'm not going to say anything about whether we're closing the door, we're leaving it open on any other investigation. Have, other I'm not going to comment on that either. And one more question. I'm sure. With, with the indictment against Kelly and Barone, could they still make a deal with you and come forward and tell you what they know? Uh, I'm not going to speculate about them right. in particular, but, 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 but I'm not going to speculate about them. All I'm going to say is that if you cover us, with any frequency, you know that it is not uncommon for people after they get indicted to plead guilty. Um, some do, some don't. And I'm not going to speculate about them whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to comment on any conversations we have or haven't had. I'm just going to say that, that right now, the current state of play is that they've been indicted by a federal grand jury on nine counts, seven each, and that their arraignment is scheduled for Monday morning at 11 o'clock in front of Judge Wigginton. Thank you all very much.